times, it's really not PIP extension that is the problem, but it's PIP flexion that is lacking. This is actually not uncommon, simply because it is so easy for the metacarpal phalangeal joints to flex instead, making it actually more difficult for the interphalangeal joints to flex. Again, the MP joint is the culprit, because what do we see? We see hyperflexion of the MP joint and no extrinsic flexion of the interphalangeal joints. This is all intrinsic muscle-driven motion. Once the MP joint is flexed, primarily with the interosseous muscles, it's extremely difficult for the patient to find and activate the extrinsic finger flexors. But this can be done with a small orthosis that maintains the MP joint in greater extension of one finger so that during finger flexion the hyperflexion at the MP cannot occur and there's greater PIP flexion that is gained. Another example of active redirection is to block the metacarpal phalangeal joints in extension. And by doing so, a number of goals that are critical to regaining full finger flexion are gained. The interphalangeal joints mobilize in both flexion and extension. The interosseous and the lumbrical muscles are both elongated maximally in the active hook posture. And within zone two of the finger, there is both maximum glide and maximum differential glide of both flexor tendons, and the active pumping reduces digital edema. The construction of this orthosis is detailed specifically in one of our online videos in the finger series. Now to construct an appropriate orthosis for active redirection, for increasing PIP joint motion, it's very important to remember that each patient may have a different balance of motion. And it's not a matter of saying, OK, it's the long finger. I always want to make this design. Because the patient may be hypermobile in some other joints or really stiff in some other joints. And so I would encourage you to think that each Orthosis needs to be unique to each patient. And you may have to spend some time trial and error. You make a small orthosis, you let it cool, and the patient moves actively. And you then determine, is it transferring and redirecting the force the way it needs to be or not? If not, you make another one. Now, I've provided some schematic drawings, and these are only suggestions. These are starting points. But what is useful to remember is that if the ring or long fingers, which are the two middle digits, if they have stiff PIP joints, you can include that finger and the two adjacent ones, and you will be able to control the MP joint of these two fingers. If, however, it's the index or the little finger, PIP joint. It now does not work so well to just do three fingers because there may be a rotational factor, particularly with the little finger hypermobility at the NP or CNC joint. So you may need to include all four fingers. Again, this is trial and error. Let's say the index finger needs to be controlled for flexion, so you want to have the NP joint relatively extended. Perhaps this is your design. For flexion, perhaps it's this or maybe it's this. It really does not matter as long as the index finger MP joint is controlled and when the patient moves spontaneously, the active motion is redirected to the PIP joint. Here we're looking at the long finger. Remember, we only need three digits, so it's fairly easy to bring the MP and extension for PIP flexion or the MP and flexion for PIP extension. The same is true of the ring finger. 
where only three are included. The little finger becomes more complicated and you may again need to do a trial and error. Just a reminder, these are for your reference. They are not literal. You may or may not want to use these exact designs. Your patient and how your patient moves will determine the exact design. Now let's take a look at actually constructing a few of these um, active redirection orthosis to apply what we've learned to a clinical scenario. Today we have a model we're using who does not have stiff PIP joints, but I think nevertheless you'll be able to appreciate how we change the direction of motion. I have cut a piece of thermoplastic material approximately three quarters of an inch wide or two centimeters to use to make this orthosis. In your clinic as a time-saving uh, approach, you could have these pre-cut and ready to go. I have warmed the material and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift the two adjacent fingers hoping that my patient will relax for me. This is a little warm. Let me know if it's too warm. So I'm going to hold these fingers in extension while I bring the material around, cut it, and while that is cooling, I'm now going to mold it so that the ring finger MP joint is going to be relatively flexed compared to the two adjacent joints. It's important while I'm doing this that I'm aware of not blocking PIP joint flexion. And momentarily when this starts to cool a bit more, I will actually have the patient flex to be sure that the MP joint flexion is not impeded because I'm blocking to facilitate PIP extension, not blocking flexion. Now it's cooled. Now let's be sure that he can fully extend, yes, and fully flex, and the PIP joint flexion is not impeded. So let's take a look at the palm to make sure that that's the fact. And indeed, PIP flexion is not limited. You will notice that MP flexion of the little finger is somewhat limited, and that's not unusual in order to adequately block the ring finger. Now we're going to block the MP joint of the long finger in extension. So I'm going to lift the long finger, take this over the ring and index finger, and then underneath, while I'm holding that finger extended, I'm going to bring the material back together and cut it again so that I have a seam there. With, if you use material that has very little memory, you can really mold this greatly to your advantage. Now you'll notice that I'm holding, I'm holding this higher. I want to make sure these two PIP joints can flex. And again, I need to wait for this to cool so that it will support the weight of the finger. Perhaps positioning like this is helpful while you're holding it. But I again will passively flex the PIP joints of the adjacent fingers as well as this finger momentarily to be sure that full PIP flexion is possible. Now that it's cooled, you can see that the MP joint is relatively more extended. And so finger extension and finger flexion shows that the force now is driven to the PIP joint and the MP joint can no longer hyperflex. I've heated the material and this time we want to block the metacarpal phalangeal joint of the little finger, which can be somewhat more challenging. I'm going to lift the two middle fingers, go over both the index and little fingers, bring the splinting material around to the volar aspect and trim it off. And then it's just a matter of holding so that these two fingers 
in the middle are extended at the MP joint more than the adjacent fingers, meaning more than the index and little fingers. So perhaps this is my easiest way to do that, is to take the weight off the middle two while I wait for this to cool. Note that you need to hold this for a rather significant period of time until it hardens. Now straighten for me. Okay, you'll notice that the little finger PIP joint has force directed to it. Now make a full fist for me. Good. And open. And close. And then turn your palm. Good. We've finished the videos of construction, but in each of those circumstances, we looked at one isolated joint that needed better motion in one direction. What if you have a joint that actually needs both flexion and extension? If the PIP joint is stiff in one direction, we only block the MP joint in one direction. But if the PIP joint is stiff in both directions, we now need to truly immobilize the joint, the MP joint, and prevent it from either flexing or extending. There is a rational way to determine the exact position that's desirable to facilitate gains of PIP joint motion. In our first example, let's imagine that the lack of motion at the PIP joint is equal in both flexion and extension. In other words, the patient needs to gain flexion as much as extension and vice versa. We then logically would place the metacarpal phalangeal joint at the mid position of flexion, about 45 degrees, immobilizing it at 45 degrees. In this position, the patient can fully actively extend at the PIP joint and they can fully actively flex. In other words, the patient can regain both directions of motion simultaneously without giving up and losing motion in one direction while gaining it in another. This is really the ideal treatment approach when PIP flexion and extension gains both are needed. But what if the flexion and the extension is not equally limited? What if the patient lacks a lot of extension and only a little flexion. Well then let's take that mid 45 degree flexion of the MP joint, the maximum 90, and let's end up somewhere between 45 and 90 degrees for the MP joint. Now remember, the more we flex the MP joint, the easier PIP extension is going to be. But if we really get close to 90, the more difficult flexion is going to be. It would be your judgment call as to whether you want to be closer to 45 or closer to 90 or right in the middle. But if extension of the PIP joint is more limited than flexion, you need to block between 45 and 90 degrees at the MP joint. The opposite however, is true if flexion of the PIP joint is more limited than an extension. Now we need to block the MP joint flexion between 0 degrees and 45. 0 degrees means PIP extension is going to be harder to gain. 45 degrees means that flexion is going to be harder to gain. So it would be, again, your clinical judgment as to which position between 0 and 45 would be ideal to regain the balance. And perhaps you start with one position and as would be normal, flexion is easier than extension. 
So I think my suggestion is always err on the side of extension because it's weaker. And in that case, then you will indeed end up with a better balance. Thank you.